for today's amazing session here in the African Father in America Club. I'm excited to be here with you really uh, for this special session. I do this every week actually where I take time with an African father who is doing amazing things to transform the world, especially from an African perspective. And today my guest is author Emmanuel Kulu Jr., who is an African historian, author of Cameroonian descent. He is, uh, he is identifying himself as from the Zulu and the Bantu tribe and is a career social worker. Kulu has a deep passion for history and the creative arts. Kulu began his professional creative career in 2015 with film writing and acting with films like The Rise, and the fall of Teflon, Bug Love, and the First Purge. It's an honor today to be here with Brother Emmanuel Kulu. Uh, and the first thing, Brother Emmanuel, I want you to share with us is imagine that you are here right now and you have the ear of all young and old African fathers worldwide. In about two minutes, share with us your message to all the yeah. black fathers, African fathers worldwide. Thank you very much. Greetings and our shade to everyone out there, um, all the African fathers around the diaspora. I want to tell everyone to instill your history into your children. Uh, share those stories. Africans, we have always been great at passing down great African stories about our lineage to our children. And this something is something we must continue to do. Let's not wait on school curriculums to teach our children. Let's teach our children right at home the glorious history of our people uh, so they grow up having strong self-identity and embracing their African lineage. Thank you so much, my brother. I am grateful. I'm grateful that we are here together for today's session. And thank you to the message to all the African fathers out there. I know that, you know, you juggle so many things. You have a media company, you are an yeah. author, and uh, you're also a father, you know. Again, if yeah. you're looking at the eyes of young black fathers who are figuring out how can they be responsible despite all the challenges that we face as mm -hmm. uh, black fathers worldwide, what would you tell them? What would you tell them that this is how to juggle so many different uh, responsibilities and interests and still stay sane? Yeah. You know, hold true to your morals, hold true to your integrity and be willing to fight, even if it means fighting into death um, for what you believe in and what you love and your passion. Pass, that is one of the main things I always want to say to the brothers out there. It is, you know, our African struggle is a tough struggle around the world, but be persistent. Persistence outlasts resistance and persistence also builds strength to all the brothers out there. Endurance builds strength. Everything that you went through, now you can put it behind you and say, I've done that and now I'm stronger now. The next time I go through it, it'll be a lot easier. So whatever trials you may face, embrace it. See it as an opportunity to conquer. And when you conquer it, now it's become an easy thing that you can do next time a lot easier. Thank you very much. Um, I love it. I love it. Now we are going to go to the reading of the first chapter of your book. Um, and uh, Ron, can you just tap your mic? I just want to make sure you hear me okay. Because, yeah. and. Yeah, I hear you good. Okay, perfect. Oh, Ron. Okay, perfect, Ron. <laughs> thank and thank you everyone for joining us for this special session. We are going to go into the reading of um, Brother Emmanuel Kulu's uh, book, I Black Pharaoh. Uh, I want you to speak about the book first and your process, uh, how you got to, like, how did this idea of creating this uh, uh, I Black Pharaoh Golden Age of Triumph, how did this idea come up for you? Uh, and then read the first chapter for us. Thank you very much. Yeah, the idea came because I actually was going to write, it actually came by accident. I was actually going to write about the great ancestor Shaka Zulu and um, we ran into some copyright issues in regards to Shaka Zulu. And I recalled another incident when I was a child, Brother Simon, uh, when my father and I, we made this King Tut sculpture for school when I was in the fourth grade. 
and um, it was we, we got a mannequin and, you know, we really had the best project. I took it to school and the teacher gave me a B minus and I was really disappointed. And when I at the end of the day, when my father came, he was disappointed. He asked, why did he get a B minus and not the best, you know, in the class? And the teacher mm -hmm. said it was historically inaccurate because we had King Tut as a black man. Mm -hmm. And that created a fire in me, brother, uh, even all the way back then till now. So after the Shaka Zulu thing didn't go through the way we planned it, I said, you know what? Let's find a great conqueror and a great queen in ancient Egypt, because this was something that was denied when I was a child. And it's starting to become common knowledge now, but it still was there's still movies out there showing the whitewashed version of Egypt. Um, so actually, um, before I read chapter two, I would actually like to read the uh, foreword first just to give people a little background on the history, if you don't mind, my brother. Yes, the mic is yours. Uh, go ahead, please. The foreword begins. I, Black Pharaoh, golden age of triumph, brings to light the true African imagery of the ancient Egyptians. For years, the media has perpetuated the Eurocentric belief that Egypt's origins came from Europe. Though Egypt is often mentioned as being part of the Middle East, it stands that Egypt resides in Africa. The author found it necessary to refer to the ancient Egyptian inscriptions and statues as the most vital proof regarding their African origins. Contrary to prior film and novel depictions, the ancient Egyptians through immaculate art and sculpturing depicted themselves as black, copper and brown skinned people. The Greco-Roman historian Aminus Marcellinus once said, the men of Egypt are mostly brown and black with a skinny desiccated look. There were many other notable historians such and philosophers who also described the ancient Egyptians as black Africans, such as Aristotle, Herodotus, and Achilles. The ancient Egyptians also shared many practices and beliefs, similar architecture as, as other African nations, such as the Ethiopians, the Puntans, the Nubians, the Kushites, Magi, and later Carthage and Zululand. And here, let me get to here. After the invasion of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, the Greeks and the Romans, many of the original Egyptians fled to the Nubian parts of Egypt. Many of them also migrated to places like modern day Sudan Ethiopia, South Africa, Mali, Nigeria, and Cameroon. The author found it appropriate to include the Western standard classification term black, which does not only mean black or melanated skin complexion, but it signifies completion amongst the ruling elite of the ancient Egyptian culture. The term black in the title, I black Pharaoh, does not reference skin complexion, but represents completion or the Pharaoh of completion. The author uh, with his recent dedication as a Jehovah's Witness has a different spiritual view since the time of these writings in 2016. He does not recommend or promote any sort of worship of any sorcery spiritism of these ancient Egyptian deities mentioned in the book. The novel by no means promotes any Afrocentric movement, racism or race superiority. It simply restores the historical fact that the ancient Egyptians or the Chemites were none other than black African people. So that's to give a, a nice background on the, the book, um, how the term black Pharaoh came about, because many people have asked me, why did you call it black Pharaoh when most of the pharaohs were black? And I said, well, the term black is what the Egyptians used it for, was for completion. So when you see a lot of these, uh, for example, King Tut, when you see King Tut's sculpture, he's painted completely black, which kind of means that this was a pharaoh. Uh, he completed what he came to do. This was a pharaoh who completed. He, he entered into his God form, so to speak. So that's what that color meant in ancient Egypt. So I just wanted to share that out there for everyone. Um, also, uh, in the book, the insertion, insertion of the word Kemet. The ancient Egyptians did not refer to their homeland as Egypt 
In fact, they called it Kemet, which means land of the blacks or the black land. The term Egypt or Egyptus was not used until the ancient Greeks made contact and conquered modern day Egypt. Therefore, I found it appropriate to use the term Kemet and Kemites when there is dialogue between the Egyptians throughout the story. While describing the scene, I used the modern term Egypt in Egyptian to help the reader make the connection. So uh, again, that word Kemet is with these actually ancient Egyptians when they spoke to each other and they described themselves or their land, that's what they called it. The term Egypt is a, is a newer term from the Greeks and the Romans. The story background before we get into the chapter here. Most of the story takes place at the peak of the 18th dynasty, beginning with the reign of Pharaoh Tutmosis II. He married his elder sister, Hap Queen Hapshetsu. They had the same father, the I. During those days, it was the ruler's tradition to keep the royal blood sacred to preserve the purity of the royal family. The Pharaoh and his queen had been trying to bear a male heir to the throne, but he failed having two stillborn male children. This was likely because of DNA corruption due to incest. The couple, however, did bear a daughter, Princess Nefereri. She was about 13 years old at the beginning of this story. The queen, being the elder between herself and the pharaoh, had often had great influence over every decision that he made. The pharaoh's council respected Hatshepsut's wisdom as it reminded them of Tutmosis I. They would often go to her so that she may persuade her husband to agree on political matters. Hatshepsut had become pregnant for a third time. Witches and sorcerers came from far and near to remove the curse of death from her womb. Whomever removed the curse would receive a rich reward and become a member of the royal family. Habshetsu had growing concerns. She dispatched sorcerers and to discover what must she do to save her unborn child. Chapter one, the black prophecy. Early during the spring of 1577 on the morning with clear skies on the desert beach of Dahab, on the southeast coast of the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt, a man sat with his legs crossed underneath him. He sighed with contentment as the sound of rushing waves crashed against the shore. A dark brown turban covered his eyes and his face, but his eyes were left exposed to the light of day. Heka Uten, an Egyptian sorcerer of great renown, languished in deep meditation. In sync with the forceful waves, he hummed and chanted, Great God Amun, reveal yourself to me. The nation has become weak as the days of the Hyksos. Rise, O Kemet. The sixth chant brought a strong wind and blew against him and dislodged his soul. His eyes closed, blacked out visions, revealed an instant out-of-body experience. His eyes opened. Heka Uten observed himself and his surroundings on a high desert mountain. Screams of terror reached his ears. Smoke and blood invaded his nostrils. He gasped, where am I? What is this? He rose to his feet. He heard a loud blast and clashing war shields. Looking down from the mountain peak, he found himself watching a great war in the high grounds. Across the top of the opposite mountain, he saw a large waterfall. He saw an older version of himself standing at the right hand of a tall, muscular, dark skinned man who wore the skin of a black lion as his cape with only his human mouth showing. Heka Odin hid behind the mountain peak. He hoped not to be seen. At the ground level below, two armies were at a standoff. They taunted each other on one side stood the mighty Egyptian army. On the other side stood the great Matani army. The hooded man raised his hand and the battle began. The Egyptians charged the Matani and shields clashed. Daggers and swords clanged, sliced through the atmosphere while the military men struck each other down. The Egyptians dispatched their war chariots 
which trampled many of the Mitannians. The Mitannian warriors, fierce fighters, began to gain an advantage over the Egyptians. Below the black hooded man, 200 Nubian arrow snipers launched their arrows towards the Mitannians and struck many of them down. Still, the Mitannian military force fought as a unit, which gave them momentum over the Egyptians. The older Hekahutan, a great sorcerer, turned to the man in a black hooded cape. My lord, Black Pharaoh, the, the Mitannians have gained an advantage on the ground level. What should we do next? Black Pharaoh, in a calm voice, replied, we have allowed these rebels to escape on two occasions. This time, I will deal with them myself. Guide me down. He jumped from the top of the waterfall into the water. The eyes of the older Hekauten glowed like fire. He used his sorcerer powers to shield Black Pharaoh. When Black Pharaoh surfaced, his garments had turned into gold armor and a gold mask, and in his hand his sword was drawn, unlike any other it shimmered. His eyes turned black as he, as he extended his hand towards the enemy. His hand released a, a smoky, dark mist, which resulted in the death of hundreds of Mitannian frontline soldiers. Frightened, the enemy retreated. Fire consumed hundreds, bodies dissolved in thin air. Black Pharaoh, with one mighty hand, had struck down everyone in his path with his sword. He regained the advantage of it for his army. The Mitannians were soon annihilated, for Black Pharaoh and his Egyptian army had cornered the Mitannian king and all his personal guards. The enemies were backed against a high cliff. The king of the Mitanni had no choice but to surrender. Great Black Pharaoh, I beg you, have mercy on me. Allow me to live and be a servant in your house. Black Pharaoh replied, time and time again, I have shown you mercy and you have rebelled and risen up against the supreme forces of Kemet. On this day, you and every nation will know that I am a mighty God of Kemet. Black Pharaoh, all will submit or perish before me. The Matanian king said, I submit. The lion face hood disappeared. Black fate Pharaoh's natural face appeared. You are wise, but Kemet has no place for a coward. He then slipped the defeated king's wind windpipe in with his sword and kicked him off the cliff into a steep pit below. The Matanian king's personal guards knelt and bowed their, he their heads in submission to Black Pharaoh. Thus, he spared them. Black Pharaoh raised his hands to the sky as his military force behind him cheered their great victory. He beheld someone peeking down from the mountain. Black Pharaoh made eye contact with the transfigured Hekauten. Black Pharaoh's eyes turned black and released a great blast in the smoky mist. When his soul re-entered his body on the beach, Hekauten realized the experience was no ordinary dream, but a prophecy of the future Black Pharaoh. Without warning, the day turned pitch, pitch black. Stunned as is possessed, he silenced his mind to tranquility and listened. A deep eerie voice spoke. You have been given the dream, sorcerer, regarding the prophecy of the Black Pharaoh. The time for his arrival draws near and you will become his eyes and ears. Hekauten gave obeisance to the high station voice and said, Amun-Ra, God of Kemet, it is you. I am honored. When shall these things take place? Amun-Ra replied, the son of Tutmosis III, Tutmosis II shall be a mighty conqueror. But the Pharaoh has no sons, Hekauten said. Are you referring to the prime minister, his adopted son? The prime minister is not born of the royal bloodline. He only lives because the queen's pity for him. The child in which I speak has not yet been born. His birth shall cause division and betrayal. Even death will strike the royal house so that it may be cleansed. 
Go to the palace and notify the Pharaoh all that I have shown you in the vision. You must announce what was revealed to you before all the people of Kemet. With all due respect, my lord, Hekahutin said, the queen has already had two stillborn children. I fear speaking on this matter, knowing that it is a sensitive one. Do as I have commanded you, Amun Ra replied. According to my will, all shall be revealed in time. Amun Ra then departed. Hakauten rose to his feet and looked across the water's horizon. The pierced call of a nearing by laughing dove startled him. With fear and obeisance and obedience, he ran towards the great city of Thebes, the capital of Egypt. Desert sands blew towards the city of Thebes. Sunbeams glazed from the day, the day forward. A multitude of exhausted Hebrew slaves pulled thick ropes, erecting massive marble images of Pharaoh Tutmosis II and his queen, Hapshetsu. The royal couple, half brother and half sister, shared the same father, Tutmosis I. Tutmosis II was born by his father's second wife, Queen Monotfret. While Hapshetsu was born of the great royal wife, Queen Amos. The slaves had been, in, been subject to bondage for a century. It was Tutmos the I who had dealt with harshly with the Hebrews. He noticed they had grown mighty in numbers. He feared a takeover would come upon Egypt as it did with the Hyksos against the previous pharaohs. He ordered the execution of all Hebrew male children and enforced harsh slavery upon them. After his death, the, death, the prejudice and harsh label afflicted on the Hebrews continued in the reign of Tutmos II. As they labored, the slaves were whipped, savagely mistreated as by the Egyptian taskmasters. As all people took their station before the throne, Sinemot, the royal steward, announced the entrance of the royal family. First came Pharaoh Tutmosis II, followed by his queen, Hepshetsu. Next came their daughter, Princess Neferiri. She was followed by the prime minister, Hepshetsu's adoptive son. Last came Isaac, the queen's maidservant. Sinemut called in a loud voice to the crowd, the god of Kemet, Amun-Ra, has given Hekauten, the sorcerer, a prophecy of a new era approaching our mighty nation. Hekauten deliver this message of prophecy to us. The people went silent as they waited for Hekauten to speak. This morning, as I sat in meditation, a vision came to me about the birth of the son of Tutmosis II. The crowd murmured in anticipation of Hekauten's continu continued and elevated voice. The boy will be a conqueror of nations, said Hekauten. He is predestined to defeat our enemies and bring us to supreme world dominance. Riches, gold, silver, livestock, and vegetation will be restored to Kemet. At that moment, Hapshetsu, who was already pregnant, looked at her husband in excitement and said, My love, the plague of death that struck my womb after giving birth to two stillborn children is no more. Amun-Ra has lifted the curse, and our son will be born as the sole heir to the throne. The pharaoh and the queen were ecstatic. With newfound hope for the future, they joined hands as they sat high above the people on their thrones. This mighty pharaoh, Hekauten said, will show his power before your eyes. He shall be called Black Pharaoh. Thunderous applause rattled windows and doors. The pharaoh and his queen raised their hands to the sky. They returned to their chambers and planned for the birth of their long-awaited son. What should we name him? The queen asked. What about Amos II, like his grandmother and great-grandfather? In love, she rubbed her belly. I am elated over this prophecy. Finally, my love, I get to bear you a son. I nearly lost hope before the sorcerer proclaimed this news. According to the prophecy, this child will change our lives in the kingdom forever. We will have a mighty warrior to defend the nation. 
I prefer diplomacy, but if a warrior is what he is meant to be, then so be it. Tutmos II stood by the window with his hands clasped behind, behind him. Of course, he shall carry his father's legacy along with my name. He replied, Black Pharaoh is a dominant title. I too, my love, am overjoyed for the next journey of on our life. I believe our son will bring us closer than we have ever been. The king rushed to his queen's side on the bed. He held her in his arms. Kisses passed between them as they passionately embraced each other. He looked into the queen's eyes and said, my love, I know I did. I know you have had great concerns about the past events regarding the two stillborn children. I know I did not support you properly, but this is a blessing. He paused and rested his hands on the top of her belly. Things will get better for us. I promise. He kissed her forehead. You took care of you take care of my son by eating well, sleeping well, drinking well, and avoiding any kind of upsetting matters. Tears pooled from Hapshetsu's eyes. She believed sincerely her husband's voice and I and, and eyes. I need you to stay here with me more often, my king, she said. I knew you need to take your rides at night to clear your head, but I need you now more than ever. The weight of ruling the world is heavy, my love, the Pharaoh replied, but I will do my best to comfort you in the months ahead. He held his queen tight and inhaled her fragrance and placed his head on her stomach. In love with the unborn child, he caressed and kissed his wife's belly in pride. Queen Hapshetsu smiled for the caresses soothed her. A hard knock at the door interrupted the king's song. Who dares to disturb me without being summoned, hissed the pharaoh. The guard of the royal chamber entered. My lord, the sorcerer demands to speak with the royal family in private, he, he said, with respect and humility. Puzzled, Tutmost II looked at Hepshetsu. Send him in. Hekauten walked into the royal chambers and bowed. Great Pharaoh and great queen, there is more to the prophecy of Amun-Ra gave me that I did not mention in front of the people regarding this child. Well, proceed, the king demanded. He stood to, the, he stood to his feet by the bed of Hep, uh, next to Hepshetsu. Afraid to be the bearer of bad news, the nervous Hekahun's bones shook as he said, A curse! came with the birth of this child in your royal house. What possible curse could my son bring us? Hepshetsu asked. Hekauten cleared his throat and replied, a curse of division and betrayal. He swallowed hard. I warn you, my pharaoh and queen, watch the sign of a betrayer for that one's betrayal will give him or her great power in commit. Who dare plot against, before Hapshetsu can finish her sentence, Tutmos II spoke up. Thank you, Hekauten, for the words of Amun-Ra. We shall keep our eyes and ears open. Anyone plotting or uttering a word of betrayal will have their eyes put out and they will be burned alive before all commit. The king opened the chamber doors and ushered Hekahun out. Nevertheless, let us celebrate my son. The next Pharaoh of Kemet will be born. The Pharaoh was not concerned about the sorcerer's warning. He refused to let go of his happiness that came with knowing he will have a son. Royal guard, shouted the king and clapped his hands. The alert and ready guard entered the chamber within seconds. Have the maid servants prepare a great festival in celebration of my son to come. The queen, on the other hand, heeded Hekahuten's warnings. She pondered his words with, with many thoughts and knitted brows. She always displayed more wisdom than her husband. That's chapter one. 
Thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel Kulu Jr. And thank you so much to everyone who is joining us live here on Clubhouse, as well as everybody joining us live on YouTube. My name is Simon Javan Okelo, and we are here for lessons from African fathers featuring author Emmanuel Kulu Jr., who uh, shared with us um, a lot. He shared with us what you would tell African fathers if they would give him uh, like two minutes of their time. That was how we opened uh, our conversation today. And uh, he was able to read the, the forward for his book. Uh, the book that we are dissecting today is called I, Black Pharaoh, Golden Age of Triumph. That's the title of the book. Uh, and Brother Emmanuel read for us uh, chapter chapter 1 and we are going to listen to the audio of chapter 2 which is amazing actually you'll really enjoy it and then he's going to read for us chapter 3 then after that we are going to uh, talk briefly about Madaraka festival um, at this moment I do want to ask you just one question and then uh, I want to invite uh, Ron um, and maybe just each person on the on the stage uh, just take maybe 30 seconds to give us a comment before we go to the next segment uh, a question or a comment to Emmanuel and then um, we will go to listening to chapter 2 again uh, this is a special segment uh, happening here in the African Father in America club I urge you to ping in someone who is not in the room with us right now Maybe ping in five to ten people that you feel need to be here right now. If you're getting value from what my brother Emmanuel Kuli is sharing with us. And if you feel that they need to learn. Because uh, for me, it's all about lessons. What can we learn from each other? How can we inspire each other through the work of our hands? Not through the words that we just say, but action. Action speaks louder than words. With that, my question to you. Uh, Brother Emmanuel is uh, your your kids uh, again. This is centering fatherhood. Have you read your this uh, book or any of your books to your children? And what has their response been? The children, of, yes, I have, and the, and the the children they absolutely love it. There are also there are some adult scenes as we'll get to in chapter three that the kids weren't able to uh read into but um for the gist of it yes because we also have converted this exact book into a children's book we will be releasing in 2022 um, so they'll be able to see these african egyptians and see themselves so to speak but um they absolutely love the story uh, thank you so much brother manuel uh i just want to ask you i if you have youtube on near you uh turn it off or mute it so that we don't have the echo no oh, no that's the uh, clubhouse let me turn it down okay perfect yeah. perfect okay. perfect thank you brother uh and again if you're just joining us uh this is an amazing session where we uh, i love interviewing african authors uh, and also authors that, who are doing cutting edge work, you know, there's, there's an author, but also there's an author that is, uh, you know, challenging uh, the status quo when it comes to what are we being uh, provided to in terms of books and content and what Brother Emmanuel Kulu Jr. is doing with his books is very, very unique. I want to pass the microphone to Ron to just ask a 30 second uh, question or leave a comment for 30 seconds. Then we'll hear from Patrick, and then Tess, and then Supreme, and then Nohe, and then we'll go to chapter two. I will play the audio for chapter two in just a moment. Again, Tess, Supreme, and Nohe are staunch supporters of the African Father in America Club. We have a room that we host here every single day. It's called the Daily African Proverbs. So check it out. Ron, the mic is yours. so important. Um, I am white, but I'm raising African children. Uh, I have five African uh, American children, and it's always been a challenge over the years uh, to have enough uh, 
representation of uh, Af African uh, history and African uh, knowledge. And um, so thank you so much. And I just uh, want to uh, say that I'm glad you have the children's book coming out because I have five grandchildren I want to share it with. And uh, thank you again for, um, for the work and the words today. I look forward to continuing the message and the listening. Thank you, I'm Ron, and finish speaking. Thank you, Brother Ron. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, it's very important that, um, I just want to say, it's very important that African children uh, be able to, throughout the diaspora, not just in America, not just back home, um, it's very important that they be able to identify with something other than transatlantic slave trade. Because this is, this is what's been pushed on black children in the states that this is this is your history and um I, I my father never allowed me to believe that and uh, when we talk about african fathers that's what my father instilled in me he always told me you know what, what's 400 years of slavery compared to 3,000 years of royalty um so that's the mentality i embrace but again, we have to do a lot of self-teaching our children about this great ancient African history. So um, I'm also um, going to be putting together with my brother, Patrick, um, who is on the stage right now, Patrick Chiguri, um, who is going to be doing the African Rising show on IBP Media. We're going to be putting together a curriculum, um, a standard curriculum of, of different of the different ancient African histories that need to be taught in schools. And we're going to try to push for it to get taught in Africa and also to get taught right here in the United States of America. So we're going to keep pushing forward, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, brother Emmanuel Kulu for your response. And thank you, Ron, for uh, the amazing question. Patrick, uh, the mic is yours. Hello everyone, um, good evening. Um, I just wanted to, you know, um, pose some gratitude, I think for um, the amazing work, um, you know, um, trying to change the narrative. Um, it's very important, um, you know, to, to impart, I think to the generation um, that we are going to give the button to. Um, and I think um, this is the starting point. Um, we have the likes of Chinua Achebe. Uh, we have the likes of, um, you know, your Charles Mungoshis, your, 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 your first liners, those that um, wrote during the struggle. You know, most of their books were more of the struggle of the then time when people were fighting against a lot of, um, you know, um, of the social ills, the segregation, and the message was that. But now we have a very difficult task at hand. And as you can see um, in, in, in the articulation that Brother Kulu did, um, this is to give um, the children or the future um, African child um, to 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 put back to put them back um, on their pedestal. So, um, you know, if you do not know your history as a great person, then there is no way you can ever think greatness. If you know yourself to be a person who's just um, supposed to be, you know, um, following trends and not setting anything, a person who just accepts inventions and never really. Um, um, is told that you are at the helm and at the top of, 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 of the food chain, then we will never see big dreamers, we will never see big achievers, and people will always, you know, question their capabilities. So kudos to Brother Kulu um, on his work. Um, I'm a fan. Um, I've read the first one and I'm busy almost completing um, the, the, this, this new um, book he released. So it's, it's, it's a great thing. And thank you also for this platform, you know, where we, 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 we seek to shape our, our family values. Um, you know, I always speak firmly about family because we cannot talk of building Africa without correcting the ills of the family. The family is the starting point. We cannot run companies 
without a, a proper family structure, we cannot run um, uh, countries. If we, 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 we don't start with the first, so family for me is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother Patrick. <clears throat> Definitely agree. You know, um, that, um, uh, you know, we, we have to be able to see ourselves in history and our children have to be able to see themselves in history throughout the world. And um, we see the things that happened to George Floyd. And I, I really tend to believe that when, when, when a white supremacist is standing over a black man with his knee in his neck, he's just thinking this man has no history. He has no reason to exist. It's because he's been miseducated himself. So it's very important that we get educated on our history and start telling our story from our perspective. So thank you for that, Brother Patrick. <clears throat> Uh, thank, you. thank you, Patrick. Hey, Tess, the mic is yours. Okay, th this is Simon speaking. Um, I'm, I'm passing. Here, I'm okay, here. wonderful, wonderful. Go ahead. Uh, hi. I literally had to run from the kitchen. I had my phone in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tess. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. Um, and I'm just glad that I came in today because I, I came in when uh, Simon was still reading. I, I think he, somebody was narrating one of the chapters. And from what I gather, it's a story about um, ancient Egypt told in a different way, correct? Correct. It's heard from an African perspective, yes. From an African perspective, okay. Yeah. And so it, it's just, it's one of those things that I have always been looking for, you know, and my search, actually, my quest uh, led me to Egypt itself, you know, to actually go looking for the answers that were missing, you know, literally all the way to Mount Sinai, just mm -hmm. going through every single piece of information that I could find. So a book like this is, I would say it's priceless, really, you know, because for some of us who don't even know how to explain some, you know, complex, um, what can I say, ideas to our children, even as they are being told a different kind of history, I think this book will come in very handy because in as much as she was there and with me and she saw everything and she was there when, you know, we were like being taught about our real history. It, it's always a good idea to have something in writing. So I think this is one of the priceless <laughs> books that um, I'm, I'm coming across and it's, it's very inspiring and very, um, what can I say? Heartwarming, actually. So I, I want to thank you for that. Yeah, you know, Sister Tess, for those watching on YouTube, um, you know, we put the cover in, in pure uh, 14 karat co uh, gold color um, for a reason, to show the richness of the riches of ancient Africa. Um, and it's, 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 it's something that we do know because we know that the scramble, we know about the scramble for Africa. We know that every country's success is built off its extortion of Africa of African resources. Um, but at one point, these resources belong to us and we, we, we built many glorious things with it. So um, I wanted to tell this from a historical fiction perspective, because I'm, uh, if you read, if you've read historical fictions, they are pretty boring. <laughs> but my book, we wanted to put action in it. As you see, the Pharaoh was taking action in the beginning in that dream. Um, you know, you see the queen and you see how powerful she was, how beautiful she was, and the, the, her husband and the royal steward, as they had to have respect to approach the pharaoh. These are things that we need to know about ourselves, that we were the beginning of civilization. Precisely. You know, this is a tool that we can use. To um, help our, I know somebody else already mentioned this, to help our children to have that pride in where they come from, you know, to have that um, 
can do attitude when they know uh, who their ancestors were, when they see those images. I remember like uh, with my daughter, just from her being there, young as she was, up to this day, nothing about Egypt or nothing about Africa passes her. Like as soon as she hears anybody mention Egypt, she's like, oh, let me, let me pay attention. What's going on here? So uh, this is, to me, this is amazing, and it's a step, it's a great, it's a giant step in the right way, because I've never been able to come across such a book, so I applaud you for that, and I'm, I'm definitely curious about your writing, so I'm going to be looking it up soon, so, yeah. Thank you, sister, greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much, Tess, and thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, no, hey, let's hear briefly from you and Helen and then Bib so that we can go to the next chapter. The mic is yours. Thank you, Brother Simon. And Emmanuel, man, I can't thank you enough, brother. It's uh, an amazing thing, uh, amazing work that you've been doing. And first and foremost, it's been almost over a year since I haven't got a, uh, I haven't bought any books, but uh, this is going to be my one. And, uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, secondly, Thank you so much for putting Quinn on the front page, and especially with those um, well, with those designs, with those uh, African figures. And I, I'm pretty, especially when we're talking about uh, the uh, Black Farah and since for the previous stories or movies that we've seen. And I'm pretty sure those who knows know what I'm talking about. And thank you for that. I really appreciate you. And I cannot wait to read uh, the entire book. And shout out to you. Thank you again. Thank you, my brother. I greatly appreciate it. For those who are looking for the book, the link is in my bio on Instagram as well to to go grab it. Paperback, ebook, and hardback. Um, you can all access it right on Amazon. Excellent, excellent. Let's hear from Helen, and then we will listen to chapter two. Helen, the mic is yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Simon and Emmanuel. It's really nice to learn about your uh, book. Uh, when I was in college, there was an anthropology student who was really obsessed with uh, um, finding um, Roman coins in uh, Egypt. And so it's really interesting to see your focus on Egypt, because his thesis was that the Romans came and stole everything from Egypt and just basically copied it. Um, so it's um, wonderful to <laughs> get to know a little bit more about that history. I think that'll be part of what's in the story that you're uncovering. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yes, it was actually, it was the Greeks first. Um, keep in mind, when we understand the history behind Egypt, everything came after. This was the first mega civilization. It wasn't the first civilization, but it was the first mega civilization. So what you see the United States is today, or what the UK is, that's what ancient Egypt was. This was the place that everyone came to. Um, there's actually inscriptions of all the different faces of the world where you actually see Caucasians, you see uh, dark Nubians, you see those of Middle Eastern descent bowing down at the feet of Queen Hatshepsut, who I'm actually mentioning uh, in this book. So it's, it's, it's very interesting to know that they, they understood uh, the different races around them as well. But this was a place where everyone came. As you see today, it's never been duplicated and another ancient Egypt has never been duplicated since its time. So people came to see the marvels, the glory um, and, and see what Egypt was all about because it was the first world power. Thank you so much, Brother Emmanuel. I'm learning a lot and, you know, audio uh, and also video because we are having this discussion where you are able to uh, read this, um, you know, a few chapters of your book uh, to today. It's really allowing us to to break it down because taking time to read is always a challenge. But once you hear an, a, a snippet of it, then it encourages you to actually read the rest of the book and also just learn a little deeper about uh, some of our great authors like yourself. So for those who are joining us uh, on Clubhouse, thank you so much. And for those who are live with us on YouTube, thank you very much. And um, I just want you all to know that we are going to listen to chapter two of uh, Brother Emmanuel Kulu Jr., who is a, 
an award winning author and also a best selling author and today we are we are listening uh, and discussing the, the his favorite three chapters of uh, his new book I Black Pharaoh the golden age of triumph and uh, I want to give a shout out to Buddy Lean TV on on YouTube uh, who is tuned in uh, and really everybody else who is tuned in here on Clubhouse thank you so much and here is chapter 2 tighten your seat belt we are taking off <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you all so much. That's really, really powerful. Uh, my brother, you put in so much work into this piece. Uh, I want you to just uh, walk me through why you chose to do an audio uh, version of I Black Pharaoh Golden Age of Triumph. And for those who are just joining us, my name is Simon. We've been here for the last hour and uh, we are creating sufficient time to dive a little deeper into the life and story of our brother, celebrated author, Emmanuel Kulu Jr., who has a new book uh, and also he has the audio that we just listened to, which is the audio preview of chapter 2. Uh, we are going to listen to him read chapter 3 in just a second. But I want him to share with us, you know, why he chose to do the audio version of uh, this book. The mic is yours. Yeah, uh, um, the goal is to transform this book into a film. Um, and I feel it gives the listeners um, a bit more visual to have, have the music. I come from the music industry. Um, I spent 15 years in the music industry. And I know the power that music has on people. It gives people the ability to peer into what they're listening to. So um, I wanted to create that visual. I wanted to create that scene where you hear doors slamming. You hear the woman crying. Um, you hear the fires torching. You hear all that. You hear the, the horseback riding. It just creates that suspense as to what's going on. And these ancient people, they're not so different than, than anyone who was wealthy, even today. So to show that connection, um, I, I believe the audio was very important. These days, as you mentioned earlier, it's hard for people to dive and read something. So I wanted to give those who just would like to just ride in their car and listen to it, that option as well. So the audio book will be coming as well in 2022. <clears throat> Fantastic. Thank you so much, my brother. Um, and again, thank you, Brother Happy Lee, for being on, uh, on, on, on YouTube with us as well for this uh, discussion. Um, now we want to quickly move into the last chapter uh, so that Brother Emmanuel can read for us chapter 3 of I Black Pharaoh Golden Age of Triumph. After that, we are going to listen to a few comments and questions from everyone in the room. And then after that, we are going to listen to the promo excerpt or snippet from Adaraka Festival. Thank you all for being here with us. This is a special session that I love hosting here in the African Father in America Club. And we really focus on lessons that African fathers who are doing amazing uh, work uh, you know, cutting edge work, whether it's in, in the literary world or whether it's in, um, you know, innovation, uh, whether it's being an author uh, like our brother Emmanuel, but also being multi-talented. Emmanuel is involved in many things, media, uh, and I just wanted to have this time that is a little more expanded than the daily African proverbs and other sessions that I typically host here on Clubhouse or in the African Father in America podcast. So thank you again, Brother Emmanuel, for creating the time. Uh, shall we move to chapter three? Yes, um, I'm going to read a smaller chapter because chapter three is quite lengthy. Um, if you don't mind, my brother, but I also I didn't want to give the full story of what's happened away. So I want to read another one of my favorite chapters. That's excellent. That's excellent. All right. This is chapter six on the first book in book two. Now, this is uh, four books in one book, by the way, for everyone who's reading it. Um, so this is the wrath of the queen comes to Nubia. In the cold on a rainy evening, Hepshetsu rode behind the supreme forces in a golden war chariot as they made way to Nubia. Hepshetsu dispatched a messenger to the Nubian camp with deceptive news. Her scheme intended to make them believe that Egypt had withdrawn their forces from the battle. In vain glory and unbeknownst to them, she planned to storm the city with relentless wrath. One Nubian general stood up 
after they heard the news. The Kemites withdrew their campaign. The cowards must have realized they cannot defeat us. Tomorrow we go to commit to overthrow and remove their Pharaoh. Once again, the Nubians shall rule commit and the rest of the world. A great day this is, men. Let us celebrate for tomorrow brings the dawn of a new era. The Nubian military chanted great cheers and celebrated until dusk. The men enjoyed themselves. They ate, drank, danced, and sang song, uh, praise songs of victory. Unaware of Hepshetzer's diabolical plan, she, spent, she sent two spies ahead of her to report the right time to strike. From a dis distance off, Hapshetsu and the Supreme Forces surrounded the Nubian camp. Unnoticed, they awaited the return of the two spies. Hapshetsu's army gathered around her. On this day, we shall take no prisoners, destroy everyone, and show no mercy. As you have heard, their plan is to storm upon Kemet tomorrow. We must eliminate them and end this tonight. Your queen is with you. Fight for your brothers and leave none of our own behind. Amun-Ra is with me. General Octo prepared the ranks for battle and waited for Hapshetsu's command. Okay, I lost my place here. Um, and waited for Hapshetsu's command. The Nubians are into their deep celebration, said one of the spies. They are blind to our presence, great queen. The second spy stepped forward. Their soldiers are quite drunk in celebration. At your command, great queen, now is the time to strike. The rain calm, calmed, ready for battle. Hapshetsu's 100,000 troops remain erect in silent battle formations. Hapshetsu sent rigid but elect. High on her horse, she rode back and forth in the front of her brigade from one end to the other and inspected her men. Unsettled by these unfamiliar battle conditions, she quieted her mind in meditation to Amun-Ra. The power of Amun-Ra came to the queen with a strong wind, which only she felt. His voice came to her, which only she heard. I have delivered the Nubians into your hand. On this day, you shall become the mightiest of all queens of Kemet. As she unlatched her eyes, she was strengthened and renewed her anxiety transformed into ambition ready for battle she drew her sword and said attack like a meteorite the egyptian supreme forces crashed down on the intoxicated nubians from the hills the nubians stirred, stirred loud chants surrounding them on every side massive rumblings vibrated the ground towards him the quake shook louder and closer by the second the supreme forces came upon the nubians with sudden fierceness unprepared and unarmed the nubian soldiers scrammed, scrambled back and forth with fire and stones queen abshetsu protected by her general octo used hand-to-hand -hand ground tactics against the nubian warriors and their general Hapshetsu lashed the rebels with her golden whip She rode as she rode by them. Glass shards on the whip sliced through the enemy's flesh with every lash. Octo eliminated all in his path with his bow and arrow. Within the hour, the Nubians were utterly defeated. Great was the loss of life. The enemy had many casualties. Survivors retreated to the safe grounds. The Egyptian forces, ecstatic, their remaining enemy had fled the scene, hailed their queen for her bravery. Hapshetsu, with pride and self-exaltation, received the praises and honor of a true pharaoh. Though the queen was covered in Nubian blood, she was overjoyed to be considered a warlord by the supreme forces. Her army shouted and chanted, Queen Pharaoh! Queen Pharaoh for the great victory. The queen showed great posture and humility as she allowed each shoulder to kiss her hand in respect. As they raided the Nubian camps, General Octo found large sacks of wine, which he brought back to his men to salute his queen. 
He said, great queen, tonight we honor you for the great victory as you stood in the place of our Pharaoh and fought amongst men to defend Kemet. Your plan was flawless. We have finally eradicated the Nubians. As Octo finished his speech, an arrow came from the sky and pierced through his heart. Octo fell to the ground. Lightning cracked and lit up the sky. Loud thunder boomed nearby. Heavy rains poured down once again. Hundreds of arrows like swarms of hornets whizzed into the Egyptian camp. About 50 Egyptian soldiers were struck dead, fell off their horses. Hapshetsu commanded her army to lift up their shields and avoid more deaths. The soldiers obeyed and lifted their shields above their heads to deflect the arrows. The arrows stopped raining down. Hapshetsu looked the sight of a legion of Nubian troops as they ascended to the hills enraged her. Destroy them all. The Egyptian Supreme Forces charged after the rebels. Assad and Habshetsu attended to Octo. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> I'll stop there. Th thank you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, I see Nohe tapping his mic here on Clubhouse. Thank you so much. Uh, these are vivid stories that you're sharing with us today i'm just so grateful i actually instead of asking a question i want to pass it to the room uh, we are live on clubhouse and we are also live on youtube and we are having an an amazing discussion uh, our topic is lessons from african fathers and today we are featuring author emmanuel kulu jr and we are at the tail end of our conversation today. We started by learning the lessons uh, from him, Emmanuel Kulu Jr., as an African father to inspire other African fathers. And he was able to share with us a little bit there. And then we listened to him reading chapter one of his book. We listened to the audio preview of chapter two. And uh, he just read another chapter from I Black Pharaoh, Golden Age of Triumph. Now I'm going to take on a few comments and any question, and then I'm going to play Madaraka Festival promo uh, audio excerpt. It's a video actually, it will be my next uh, Instagram post right after this conversation, so you can watch it there. Um, and if you want the video that I'll be sharing, it's only 55 sec seconds. You can also have it because we are looking uh, to promote Madaraka Festival, which is uh, an amazing event that I've been producing for seven years that brings African and African-American artists together. Uh, and uh, the proceeds from this event goes into supporting the education, music and art program in Kenya, in Kisumu, Kenya, where I come from, uh, where we give opportunities for young artists to be uh, you know, professional musicians. Uh, we give opportunities to storytellers, to become film producers, and uh, we, we teach dance and a number of things since 2013. So it's time for us to upgrade our equipment, and that's why we are doing Madaraka Festival on July 25th. you listen to the promo in a moment. Let's hear from uh, Beeb. Uh, what did you think uh, about today's session? Just a brief comment and then we'll go to Patrick. To be honest with you, the only uh, book written by, I would say, an African American or story out of African history was The Roots. And I cannot wait to get my hands on this. And so far, I've been very uh, sucked into it, and I want to know more. And I'm just impressed. It's really beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that here. And Emmanuel, thank you so much. And the book is amazing. I love the audio as well as um, the book itself. So I can't wait to get a copy. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. You know, it's um, it's uh, one of those things where um, <clears throat> people think of history and they think uh, – these people didn't have situations that we have to this very day, you know, infidelity and relationships. And uh, just because these were kings and queens didn't mean that didn't exist. 
And also uh, the chapter that I read, The Wrath of the King or Queen Comes to Nubia, is to show how these ancient African women even fought on the front line of wars at times to show the strength of African women. So uh, thank you for that, my sister. Thank you, uh, Behib, and thank you, Brother Emanuel. Let's hear from Patrick. Okay, we'll move on to Tess. Uh, Tess, let's hear from you. Just your closing Sorry, comment. Can I add something real quick? Of course, of course. Go ahead. Yes, and I was also going to say uh, Clubhouse now has DMs, so th th there's that. It's a great tool to use. That's right. That's right. They just released it earlier today, and uh, I used it to actually, you know, let people know about this discussion and uh, yeah i love it i love it i think it's going to centralize the communication uh, when you're doing rooms instead of having uh, conversations elsewhere you can have it here but i think it's still an inconvenience too because when you're having a room this app glitches a lot and when you're having a room and you're still typing a message there with the group that you're having a room with it's for me i just feel like i'll still be using instagram for a while <laughs> because uh, this app is still in the works they have not figured it out completely so i will use it whenever i feel like especially when i want to message people uh that i feel like they ignore me on other apps you know <laughs> so, so there's no shortcut here you know uh you'll be in the same room with them and you just message them and then they will know they will know that he's actually caught me and i'm ignoring them <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah yeah so some of the first people that i messaged were like the leadership of clubhouse you know and i messaged them the link to this room join us you know <laughs> yeah okay good move brother good move yeah i mean yeah i mean because this is rich content we are bringing to their platform yeah. this is where they need to be they won't find it elsewhere you know so our job is to just let them know if they choose choose to attend it's up to them you know but this is the type of content they were talking about in the last clubhouse town hall you know um yeah yeah hey tess uh, how are you share with us your closing comments uh, for today's time with uh, author emmanuel kulu jr okay we'll go to nohe because i can't hear from tess so we'll go to nohe nohe uh, what are your thoughts about oh there comes this no problem go ahead yeah it's it's okay go ahead no i'm i'm literally sitting here i'm mesmerized i'm hanging on to every single word on this i'm thinking right after this book i'm going to figure out how to get a hug i had to have a call because i am literally hanging on to every single word so this is good stuff yes, we are having a thank you sister tess yes it's it's a, it's in it's very um it's very heartwarming to know that your ancestors our great queens of the past um were warriors were fighters, were the strongest women in the world, and to embrace that, uh, because we still face many challenges today. Um, even with royalty, being royalty, these African women stepped down and, and, and would fight with their kingdom. So um, shout out to uh, the legend of Queen Imani Reyes, the legend of Hapshetsu. Uh, you know, there's many great warriors, queens, that were the original Amazon women. So it's uh, definitely something that we can take from this to empower ourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm very grateful for that. My name is Seth, I'm done speaking. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tess. Uh, let's hear from uh, Nohe. Nohe, are you there? Hey, Simon, Brother Simon, thank you. And uh, Emmanuel, again, man, thank you. I really appreciate you. And like you say, you know, uh, hearing and learning about the great uh, queens uh, from ancestral, ancestrally, 
is such an amazing thing uh, and uh, we can't wait we can't wait as a single dad to a daughter is this is one thing that i always look forward to to teach her to show her uh like where she came from and where uh how uh, her previous uh, ancestors been the strongest of all you know and showing her all that and like you say you know, we, we we had uh, so many we have so many uh um uh queens that led so many battles and won and but we haven't able to put it out there in uh, education the new generation or the coming generations as well especially we also have the you know the axum uh, axum kingdom where we had several yes. like um if they get tied to uh minister minister saba or as as the others will call her Queen Sheba, <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, they they like they're one of the 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 leading ones, you know, and w like they're like they've been so smart about it, the way they brought the Ark of the uh, Ark of the Covenant from uh, King Solomon, and all, all these things it shows you like there's so many stories. By the way, Emmanuel, earlier what you said just got in my in my head, and uh, like no matter how I will shake it, it will never gonna go away when you say. Um, in at school they teach uh, they teach the kids about the 400 years of slavery but it's great to teach them to let them know about the 3000 plus years of reality that was so beautiful and appreciate you this is no uh, i yield the mic to you yes brother and um we we have so much that we have to learn and we have to bring forth in regards to our history um, and you talked about the Aksum Kingdom, Abin Senya, uh, the Zulu land. Uh, we can go to the great Zimbabwe. Uh, we can just talk about ancient Mali. You know, Egypt wasn't it. There were so many other great, uh, the Benin Kingdom. I mean, we can go on and on on these great African kingdoms. In fact, uh, the Aksum Kingdom is what brought forth what we know today as Christianity, which was where the first church was found. Um, it, there's a great excavation of this great church that was dug 250 feet uh, below below the surface. Um, just just the monumental things that ancient Africans were able to do that has been hidden from our history is something that we need to know to 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 feel empowered as to where we can go in the future. Just like that Sankofa bird, always looking back to know where they're going forward. Thank you, Brother Emmanuel. I'm grateful and thank you, Nohe, for, you know, um, your comments and your question. Helen, share with us your comment and your question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I've, I've enjoyed um, listening and um, definitely the uh, book, uh, Going the Fiction Route, definitely sparks um, uh, curiosity about the actual history. So um, with the last chapter, just listening um, to the conflict between the Egyptians and the Nubians makes me want to go back and research and find out what that relationship was was uh, like. Um, and then also, um, Emmanuel, I was wondering whether you whether you know about, uh, his name is Baba Todd. He's just a really great resource in case you don't know him. No, but I would love to know him. Please send me the information through uh, my DM if he's into history. Um, as for your question with the Nubians, which are the Kushite people? I'm sure if you uh, have read the Bible, you've heard of Kush or the um, the people of modern day Sudan, which is right below uh, Egypt. Um, there's There's been conflict between these two nations, but there's also been, they've also been allies. In, in many parts of history. So um, it's it's calm, It's kind of like um, <clears throat> the United States and Canada. You know, sometimes they have conflict with each other in regards to certain things, um, but they're neighbors, you know, like, you know, Cameroon, Nigeria, they're neighbors. Um, so they shared much, much culture together. In fact, ancient Kush had more pyramids than Egypt did. And still does standing to this very day. So, you know, it's that's a very strong history to to know um, about ancient Nubia, uh, to know the different the different connections between uh, history between the Egyptians and the, the Nubian people. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Helen, and thank you very much, uh, Brother Emmanuel Kulu Jr., for taking your time and spending, you know, the last hour and a half with me so that we could go deeper into your book, I, Black Pharaoh, Golden Age of Triumph. Now, I would love for you to share with everyone in the room how they can stay connected with you and also where they can get copies of the book and also speak about your media company you've been you have a large team and you're interviewing a lot of uh, significant people speak about that briefly and then after that we will play the madaraka festival promo okay sounds good yeah um you can grab this book on amazon it's also on um, barnes and nobles um, you can grab it from the publisher pennant publications um, you can grab it from them. I would prefer, I prefer to use Amazon. I just like Amazon. I use it for a bunch of other things. You can get the hardback, you can get the paperback, or you can get the ebook. Uh, they're all three are, and if you go to my, the link in my bio, you can connect if you need to connect with me on Ancient African Studies, which myself and Brother Patrick and uh, Sister Violet, who was in the audience earlier, we will be putting together a lot of African um African uh, events where um, and brother Simon I also I haven't let you know this yet but I will be reaching out to you in regards to connecting uh, rethinking Africa's contribution to world history so um, for those who are interested in being a part of that event we're looking to do something around September late September and we want to connect the entire diaspora very similar to what you did um, in Africa Day uh, but we want to have uh, African-Americans, Africans in, 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 in different parts of the world speaking about their struggle, the different things they've struggled with. So we'll be doing that. So feel free to hit me up on that um, and I'll keep you updated on that. Um, the media company, IBP Media, our goal, international broadcasting program, our goal is to connect the world uh, and representing the misrepresented areas. India has been misrepresented. Native Americans have been misrepresented. Africans have been misrepresented. Asians have been misrepresented. You know, even the the uh, every, average everyday Caucasian, some of them have been misrepresented as well. We want to represent those misrepresented communities to give them a voice, to, to speak for the people and by the people. So we want to connect all the people of the world um, who have been misrepresented to tell their story um, through podcasting, through media, through breaking news. We want to change the narrative. Media is the most powerful tool that even miseducation of African history has come through. So now we want to rebuild the miseducation with real education from the people. So that's IBP Media. You guys can hit me up at uh, iblackpharaoh.com. If you want to hit me up, you can also reach me on Instagram at IBP Media Group. I'm also uh, I am underscore K-U-L-U, Kulu. I am underscore Kulu on Instagram as well. You can reach me there if you would like to connect. And um, I'm looking forward to continue to build with everyone. Thank you, my brother. This is Simon speaking. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. And uh, with that, I'm going to play the the Madaraka Festival except it's just uh, less than a minute and when it ends uh, we will end the room but if you want to learn more about Madaraka Festival before I play this uh, clip you can go to the fifth profile sorry fifth club on my profile <laughs> fifth club on my profile and you'll be able to learn more um, the fifth club on my profile is One Vibe Africa and um We've already scheduled uh, the event, which is happening July 25th, uh, Madaraka Festival. It's happening in person in Seattle. It's happening here on Clubhouse and also on YouTube and Facebook. On YouTube, not YouTube and Facebook, on YouTube only. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be an amazing event. You're going to listen and learn a little more. But this Sunday at 7 p.m., we will be having a room here on Clubhouse where we will be talking to one of the featured artists who are performing at Madaraka Festival. So here is the clip and take good care of yourselves. Again, Brother Emmanuel, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to working with you on many, many things. 
uh, I would love to work with you to get this book to the continent as well, especially Kenya where I come from, so that we can get it to the to the grassroots uh, and and create. Uh, I, I I would love to create like grassroots book clubs, you know, because in the villages and in the communities, uh, we have people who who are interested in these types of content, but they don't have access to it. Exactly. So they're only the only types of books they have access to is the Bible and the Quran, you know, <laughs> or the books from schools, you know, and that's not always all, you know. Yeah, there's a lot more to explore. Uh, with that, thank you again. I want to give a special. Hey, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, like uh, I know Emmanuel is thinking about upcoming uh, to do this uh, room to open, uh, similar to the African Day. Yeah. And one individual, Emmanuel, I really recommend. You probably know him, but he's on the audience. Eric Magamari, my, oh. my brother Eric has been yeah. since yes. day one. He's an amazing guy for uh, for being the voice for the voiceless. Hell, Eric, he, he can tell you more about it. And I really want to, if, if I can see you guys link up and working in regards to uh, being the voice for the uh, voiceless communities and uh, uh, countries or uh, any for that matter. But I, I just want to give a shout out to Eric as well. Yeah, yeah I, shout I, out to Eric. We know Eric very well. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to Eric. Yeah, I got to send you all some love. I was down there trying to be on the DL. No, I'm having some mental health issues. So when I hear my name and some good things, it was a good time. And see, God, God is good. Muscle, I'm a Yes, uh, my I love brother. you all, man. I wish I could be out there, uh, Simon, in uh, late July. If I had, if my dad's breathing was a little better, I was thinking about coming out and surprising you all, and meeting you all. But uh, I don't know. I got with my my dad's health. I don't think I'll make it. But I I, I wish you luck, and I'll do anything to promote that. Oh, thank I don't you. I know by any of y'all, you know that. Well, thank you, too, my so brother, much. to promote it for you. In, in, in yeah, fact, send me a detailed book. flyer because I'd, I'd like to share your book with my, I can share it with like three or 400 students who are in my class. It's actually a good time to plug it. So send me a proper, like, good flyer to my email. You got okay. me on Insta. We follow each other and shit. Yep, yep. I'm going to send it to you uh, as soon as room. we Sorry, I was late. Love you guys. All of you. <laughs> Simon. Oh, All right, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. I, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, the Eric, the African, Africanness in Eric is so evident. He can't avoid hey. it. You know, he's a uh, -E, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> 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 thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us. Here is the clip um, that uh, I've been talking about.